morning, good afternoon, and good evening. My name is Dennis Quack, and I'll be your host today. Um, welcome to Imagining Educational Futures, a webinar series brought to you by the National Institute of Education, Singapore. The webinar series aims to be different, to ask some of the important questions in education, such as what are the purposes of education? How can schools facilitate social equity and mobility for all students? What kinds of reforms are needed to support teachers in the new educational landscape? How can schools and communities work together to further support vulnerable students? The aim is to pull inter and multidisciplinary thinking to get thought-provoking dialogues going for the purpose of reimagining the future of education, especially given the increasingly volatile futures we face. Uh, today's topic is the relevance of Asian cosmopolitanism in, in, to education. And it's important for three reasons, I think. Uh, first, we wanted the first topic of this series to really open up academic and public discourse around what really matters in education. And as the speakers will highlight, Asian cosmopolitanism is a critical topic in today's uh, day and age, as new forms of nationalism, populism, reactionary ideas, race, supremacy, all are worrying trends nowadays. Uh, global imperatives like Industrial Revolution 4.0, along with other political drivers, are creating new societal and political fault lines um, and exacerbating the plight of increasingly voiceless and marginalized communities. Who are we is going to become a key question of this century, I believe. Uh, second, the COVID-19 pandemic has brought everyday cosmopolitanism, uh, cosmopolitanism to our schools and our living rooms as technological affordances such as Zoom allows us to have a fantastic panel of speakers from literally around the world, uh, some of whom are sacrificing precious rest time to be with us today. Uh, the same applies to some of our international audiences. Um, welcome to the Singapore Time Zone. Zoom has opened up possibilities of intercultural encounters, making them routine and making it possible to be more open to other cultures, other people, ways of living and, and sleeping as well. Uh, Cross-cultural academic dialogues are no longer constrained by expensive flight tickets. And we are all the more thankful uh, to be able to engage with such luminary speakers today. Uh, third, this topic on Asian cosmopolitanism did not emerge in a vacuum. Uh, the speakers have contributed towards a recently published special issue of the Asia Pacific Journal of Education titled Asian Cosmopolitanism, uh, Living and Learning Across Difference, um, arguing against a largely Eurocentric notion of cosmopolitanism associated with Western Enlightenment traditions. Uh, the contributors to the volume looks at the contributions of Asian philosophies and religions uh, towards a cosmopolitan educational philosophy, as well as the kinds of pedagogical interventions that can be informed by such an approach and the challenges faced in curriculum and schools with ways forward. Uh, we, we have therefore invited our speakers to engage with central questions like what is Asian cosmopolitanism? Why is it important or even necessary for us to hear about it today? And how can such knowledge help educators locally and internationally in their daily practices and reflections? Um, now, before I introduce the first speaker of the day, let me remind you of a few housekeeping rules uh, for, for today's sessions. Um, if you'd like to ask a question, please type your question into the Q&A box that can be found at the bottom of the, your Zoom panel. Uh, we seek your kind understanding that some questions may not be addressed during the session. Uh, please note that this session will be recorded. And if you have any queries or face any technical issues during the course of this webinar, uh, the best approach is to really log in and lo log out and then log back in or to reach oer.pubs at nie.edu.sg. Uh, so with, with all that out of the way, uh, let's get started. It brings me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker of the day, Professor Fazal Rizfi. Um, Fazal is Professor Emeriti at the University of Melbourne, as well as the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. He has written extensively on issues of identity and culture in transnational contexts, globalization and education policy, and Australia-Asia relations. His book, co-authored with Bob Lingard, Globalizing Education Policy, is read widely and has been translated into numerous languages. A collection of his essays uh, is published in Encountering Education, in the Global by Routledge. Um, Fazal is a fellow of the Australian Academy of the Social Sciences and a former editor of the journal Discourse Studies in Cultural Politics uh, of Ed Education, as well as the past president of the Australian Association of Research in Education. 
So without further ado, let's welcome Fazal to share with us on the topic, Asian Cosmopolitanisms in Contact Zones. Fazal? Thank you very much, Dennis. I'm really delighted to be participating in this important seminar. Uh, and I know that there's a huge amount of organization that has gone into it. So I'm grateful to the organizers. Uh, now, in this special issue that you referred to of the Asia Pacific Journal of Education that Suzanne and I guest edited, uh, we showed how the idea of cosmopolitanism is not an exclusively Western context. Even if in contemporary discussions, its origins are invariably assumed to lie in Greek philosophy, in particular the Stoics. We demonstrated how this assumption is fundamentally flawed and that even if cosmopolitan cost sentiments expressed, uh, are, have been expressed in forms that vary considerably, they can be found in most civilizational traditions around the world. Within Asia, for example, these sentiments have be, existed in India, in Japan, in China, Arabian region, as well as various religion traditions, including Islam, Buddhism, and Hinduism. Of course, the ways in which cosmopolitan ideas have been expressed have not been the same, but are closely linked to the various traditions of thinking about engaging with the world. Expressions of cosmopolitanism are invariably aligned to metaphysical consumption, uh, as conceptions of human nature, society, and the divine. The realization that uh, while in general philosophical terms, Cosmopolitanism implies the need to view the world as globally interconnected and globally interdependent, and to see ourselves as belonging to a single moral universe. Culturally, these ideas have been translated and practiced in different and dynamic ways. Traditions of thinking about uh, uh, cosmopolitanism have thus never been, uh, have also not been static. They have changed. They have developed uh, under shifting conditions especially as they have encountered other cultural and religious perspectives. When cultures meet and rub up against each other, thinking of people changes too. Historically, shifts in an understanding of cosmopolitanism have often been imperceptible and slow, but in times of growing mobility of people across borders, major social transformations and turbulence, and major technological and economic shifts, uh, the new ways of thinking about, uh, uh, about how we might relate to each other inevitably arise. Indeed, it's worth noting that uh, the notion of cosmopolitanism, as we now understand it, in ancient Greek emerged during the Persian Wars and major changes in the ways in which people conceptualize their understanding of ethics and politics, rights and responsibilities. And indeed, it was located within intense debates between the rationalists such as Plato and Stoics such as, uh, such as Diogenes. The, case, the same is the case in other contexts as well. Cosmopolitan thinking in India, for example, has always been shaped by its colonial and other encounters as people from different backgrounds have come in contact with each other, existing ideas have been challenged by alternative ways of looking at and engaging with the world. And as groups of people have sought to describe to others their own moral schema. So as a result, scholars and philosophers have got together and talked about these things. Uh, sentiments have changed uh, and the ideas have changed their, their meaning. Uh, and in the process, some of the differences have been preserved, while others have been abandoned or modified. In other words, there is absolute dynamics. Now, all this, of course, does not happen in some neutral liberal space. New hybrid formations have always emerged through, though invariably under the conditions of asymmetrical relations of power. Some 30 years ago, um, a, a, a social theorist and literary theorist, Mary Louise Pratt, used the term contact zones to describe how these those space these spaces were uh, uh, those spaces where cultures meet clash and grapple with each other often in context of highly asymmetrical relations of power such as colonialism slavery uh, or their aftermaths as they are lived out in many parts of the world today in her book imperial eyes travel, writing, and transculturalization, published in 1992, 
Mary, Mary Louise Pratt suggested that under colonialism, local populations had to rethink their traditional ideas to bring them into alignment with Western contrast, constructs. And that after a period, it became impossible for them to recover some authentic or indigenous notions of ideas. They became in, in, invariably translated and reformed as a result of their encounters within the various traditions. We can see that that has happened as cultures and communities, religious traditions have run into each other, things have changed. And as a result, some uh, issues um, have, 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 been, have, 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 been, have been changed completely, some have been abandoned, and some have been uh, revived in one way or another. This focus on the notion of contact zones, in my view, underlines the importance of seeing Asian cosmopolitanisms through the prism of not only the enormous diversity that has always existed in Asia, but also its experiences of interconnectivity. In other words, we need to historicize where our ideas of uh, cosmopolitanism have come from. The challenge, this challenges the view of Asian uh, traditions as static and homogeneous. They have changed over the years uh, and over the centuries. We need to repeatedly say that communities in Asia have always contained vast differences that exist across region, across religion, gender, and political divides. And that these differences have not and do not only simply exist, but are produced through various forms of intercultural contact and exchange. In other words, the notion of interculturality becomes absolutely central through the prism of which we should think about cosmopolitanism and Asian cosmo with intra-Asia as well as Asia, Asian com communities interacting with others. Uh, uh, to my mind, in the, in the term intercultural, the term inter is much more interesting than culture. And as a result, uh, I really am interested in uh, finding out how after 200 years of colonialism and contemporary forms of asymmetrical globalization, the ideas of cosmopolitanism that are called Asian cosmopolitanism have emerged out of the intercultural the, uh, contact and exchange between uh, what is now called East and West. Yet, I think it's important to note that notions of core Eastern and Western tradition mask the irrefutable fact that all cultures are dynamic, changing through engagement with other cultures, not only through the development of new forms, but also through the struggle to maintain traditions. So in other words, there is always a tension between embracing the new and retaining the old. And uh, I think many of our understandings of cosmopolitanism lie within that space. In my view, therefore, in the commonly used phrase, East meets West. Neither the term East nor the term West is useful, but the term meets, meets, because it's through an understanding of meeting that we developed our understanding of what East is imagined to be and what West is imagined to be. In other words, uh, the dynamics and the pol politics of, uh, of meeting is something that we need to pay greater attention to than the concepts of East and West themselves, which are of course imaginary construct, but uh, uh, they're useful for describing very generally certain things, but they, their understanding only emerge if we, if, when we understand uh, the politics of meeting of cultures, that ideas of, uh, indeed the ideas of East and West only become imagined in the first place with the meeting if there, were, if there had been no meeting, then we wouldn't need the concept of East and West. Uh, in other words, uh, there is constant um, uh, 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 exchange, there is constant uh, inter, 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 interconnectivity, and it's that interconnectivity that produces our ideas of uh, cosmopolitanism and indeed most other concepts. Now, in the context of globalization, of course, this has become even more complex. And as a result, in the contemporary era, we need to actually understand how interconnectivity now um, has different form than it had during the colonial era or pre-colonial era, or indeed any other area, era before then. In the context of globalization, there's of course, unprecedented level of global mobility. But when we talk about global mobility, we invariably think about people 
mobility. But there are other things that move as well. Cultural practices move, money and capital move, media and images move, ideas and ideologies move. But most importantly, from my perspective, affective domain moves as well. Hopes and desires, if you like, people's aspirations move as well. As a result, we develop different sentiment, sentiments uh, and our sense of, uh, of what it is that we regard as good or bad, or what is, it, what is it that we desire and we don't desire, become a product of mobility. Uh, these things, in other words, the affective domain moves as much as uh, material or indeed cognitive stuff. Everyone is affected by these mobilities, even if in ways that are incredibly uneven, given the asymmetries of power within which even global processes now take place. Our lives are increasingly shaped at the intersection of these mobilities, these mobilities of, uh, of culture, of people, of ideas, and of ideologies, and of sentiments. And that's the point that I really want to highlight. So as a result, we need to actually be very clear that our understanding of global of uh, cosmopolitanism in the contemporary era cannot ignore the realities of global processes in which uh, mobility of, uh, of desire, mobility of uh, hopes, mobility of aspirations are as important as, uh, as are the, the aspects of money and people and cultures and and so on. So, in other words, we start thinking about ourselves in ways uh, very differently as a result of the connectivities, as a result of the politics, the cultural politics of meeting. And as we meet, then sentiments change as well. In the contemporary era, the possibilities of cultural contact and exchange are multiplying, of course, faster than ever before, driven largely by developments in information, communication, and transport technologies, giving rise to new strategic and economic opportunities. But they're also giving rise to uh, how we change our sentiments, our ideas of who we think we are, and how is it that we want to be connected to the world, and how is it that we regard the world as a moral universe within which we are located, and within which we think about our, our, our national belonging, our local belonging, and with it. In other words, uh, uh, global mobilities of all these different kinds provide the backdrop against we understand connectivity and against we think about our moral aspirations of uh, in, in, in the contemporary era, this is in really important because it is these exchanges, is these meeting, if you like, uh, it is the global interconnectivity and that has given rise to um, uh, economic opportunities and various other kind of communicative opportunities, but it's also given rise to fear and anxieties uh, and the ways in which we think about how our traditions are being usurped by the processes of globalization, just as they were uh, by the processes of colonialism. There is a wonderful little poem that uh, Judith Wright, one of Australia's leading poems, uh, po poets, uh, uh, put it. And I'll read that, just one, one, one part of it, um, that I think relates to what I, want to, what I want to finish up with. Judith Wright says, when East becomes North and the West is under your feet, your compass spins frighteningly. To calm it, you must find yourself a new axis. In other words, our compass is really shaking. The directions are not clear any longer. And the word cosmopolitanism in its dynamic form, in its ways in which uh, I have presented it as a aspect of interconnectivity, as an aspect of mobility and mobility of our sentiments and our hopes and desires uh, become really quite important part of um, how we might uh, de de develop up for ourselves a new axis a new cosmopolitanism against the framework of these circumstances that are incredibly uh, uh, profound and incredibly important. And of course, education then has a major role to play. And I'm sure in the questions and answers, we'll be able to explore some of those, but I can see that my time has run out. So I will stop now, Dennis. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fazal.
uh, for that really wonderful presentation um, and, and the idea of refocusing on the effective domains, um, not just the material global flows, but um, effective and emotional flows as well. Um, I'd like to introduce the next speaker, uh, Professor Liz Jackson, uh, who will be sharing with us the topic, uh, Cosmopolitanism in Hong Kong Education, East versus West. Uh, Liz is a professor of international education at the Educational University of Hong Kong. She is also president of the Philosophy of Education Society of Australasia. Her research interests are in philosophy of education and global studies. She is author of Muslims and Islam in US Education, Reconsidering Multiculturalism, Questioning Allegiance, Resituating Civic Education, and Contesting Education in I and Identity in Hong Kong. Liz, over to you. Well, thank you very much uh, for that introduction, Dennis, and, and thanks so much to Suzanne and all the organizers for inviting me to participate in this session. Uh, so at the beginning of Fazal's presentation, he mentioned a special journal issue that he and Suzanne edited, and I'll be talking about my contribution to that. And um, Fazal has done a, a, such a beautiful job of laying out these general issues. Of course, Asia is such a, a large, you know, sort of unfathomably large area to discuss Asian cosmopolitanism. So I'm going to be looking at sort of the nitty gritty factors and also exemplifying these issues of dynamism around East meets West and how positionality is really linked to the effective domain within the context of Hong Kong. So I'll be discussing Hong Kong, um, philosophical conceptions of cosmopolitanism that are relevant to the society, the political location and position and cultural location and position and how that plays a role in the way cosmopolitanism is uh, celebrated or not considered. And then also uh, making some references to education and curriculum because I've done a lot of research on how the curriculum in Hong Kong discusses identity, interculturalism, multiculturalism, uh, and national issues since the handover. So when it comes to uh, the philosophical perspective on cosmopolitanism, uh, Hong Kong is quite influenced by uh, Confucian philosophies. And I think, uh, you know, none of these philosophies exist in isolation from each other uh, in, in life today. So you can see some direct intersections. Uh, certainly Confucianism and cosmopolitanism do have some shared values. Um, and although people might discuss cosmopolitanism as Western or universalistic, um, Confucianism, as well as uh, Buddhism and some of the other traditions uh, that are influential in Chinese and Hong Kong society, celebrate mercy, compassion, uh, and tolerance, and mutual understanding. Uh, Confucian cosmopolitanism can be also linked to some Western conceptions of cosmopolitanism that focus on the specific uh, particularities of a situation, uh, which means that it's more connected to a rooted cosmopolitan view uh, as uh, promoted by Anthony Apaya, for example. Uh, in Chinese uh, societies, they're influenced by Confucianism. There tends to be more of a focus on personal, uh, social and moral dimensions. And in Hong Kong, there's a long history as well as of depoliticization of curriculum. So thinking about things in a moral way as opposed to a political way where things become a bit more complicated. Uh, both Confucian and Western views of cosmopolitanism in general will definitely celebrate a sense of caring. Uh, so one of, the, one of the issues here is how much care should you have for people who are close to you versus far away from you? Uh, in, in Confucian and Chinese traditional culture, there tends to be a focus on treating uh, people that are close to you better than other people and that being part of um, some traditional views of Chinese society with ancestor worship, with filial piety. Um, and so that might be different from some very Western views of cosmopolitanism. On the other hand, it's not that different if we think of cosmopolitanism as a rooted phenomenon. Uh, so uh, from a rooted perspective, Confucianism and cosmopolitanism can also be linked uh, for appreciating that people play particular roles in connection with each other. On the other hand, I think a Western cosmopolitan view uh, will tend to celebrate equality more than 
uh, Confucianism does as, as a key value. Um, although as, as Falzel mentioned, you know, East only exists when it's, when it's next to West. Uh, and so I'm gonna tease out these dimensions and what the difference they make in real life um, a bit more when it comes to the politics and educational context of Hong Kong. So, so Hong Kong is uh, recognized as a Chinese society and uh, also as an East meets West society. So there's these sort of dual interpretations of the key identity of Hong Kong. 92% uh, of residents in Hong Kong are categorized as ethnic Chinese, uh, but I think that this categorization really overlooks a lot of diversity. Uh, first of all, a lot of ethnic minorities who are essentially permanent residents of Hong Kong are not included in those figures uh, because people who come to Hong Kong as domestic helpers are not counted. Um, they, they're not eligible to be permanent residents. Additionally, uh, there's a lot of discourse about it being a Chinese society. So Hong Kong Chinese people are very diverse too. They, they don't have a single national cultural allegiance to Hong Kong or China, but in many cases have dual citizenship in, uh, in Hong Kong, China and in other countries abroad, Western countries specifically like Canada, UK, um, Australia and New Zealand. Uh, so although on the one hand you might describe Hong Kong as a Chinese society, uh, it's also, it also has similar issues that make intercultural education and multiculturalism as a policy quite critical because there is a lot of diversity and there are also challenges around discrimination and racism um, that, are, that are quite negatively experienced by ethnic minorities today. Uh, another complicating factor is Hong Kong is facing tensions uh, that are competing, which can be described as decolonization and recolonization because it, it was uh, decolonized from the perspective of, of British colonization. The British were here for more than 100 years and handed over to mainland China in 1997. Since then, there's been a kind of recolonization uh, because uh, Hong Kong is now part of another larger entity and has to sort of find its place within that. Uh, you know, if you've, if you've seen the word Hong Kong in the news in the last two or three years, um, I don't think I need to really emphasize the point that this is quite controversial. Um, people do feel upset and confused. Uh, and part of that has to do with an education system, which for the vast majority of the last century avoided a sense of national identity. So it makes in Hong Kong very interesting um, as a case study to think about cosmopolitanism is that Hong Kong people didn't really have a strong sense of national identity. Historically, they were not encouraged to identify nationally with the British government. Um, and at times there's been some, some hints towards that. There have been some times where the British wanted Hong Kong people to identify with British government and not the Chinese government. But in general, there was a move that they called depoliticization. Um, and this led Hong Kong people to uh, learn in schools and to celebrate an identity very based to the global uh, free market economy, to an economic and increasingly neoliberal sense of globalization, um, and to see that as something really good about Hong Kong and to see itself as Hong Kong's, um, as Asia's world city. Some, interest, some other interesting trends here um, is what Wing On Lee has described as delocalized internationalization. Um, and this is the sense that in Hong Kong, discussions about global citizenship education, globalization, and even cosmopolitanism, these aren't controversial concepts in Hong Kong. So I grew up in the United States, their internationalization is a bit more controversial and globalization, because uh, there's this sense of isolationism. Uh, similarly with mainland China, there has historically been a sense of isolationism there, not a cosmopolitan or international orientation. So Hong Kong people have seen themselves as sort of intrinsically global, as intrinsically cosmopolitan. Um, and so the local uh, and localisms are linked in this case to a cosmopolitan identity, whereas the opposite trend, delocalized nationalization is more linked to this sense of recolonization wherein um, Hong Kong 
the local identity is going away as national identity is surfacing. We see that very much in education today. It's become a very hot topic. Again, every, every 10 years, the government says we need to have more national education because um, there's a awareness that Hong Kong people do not identify positively uh, as citizens of mainland China. Uh, so they try to encourage this sense. Hong Kong people feel like what is essential about Hong Kong is disappearing in that sense. Uh, so there's a sense that Hong Kong is a global place, is a cosmopolitan place, is East meets West. And in that context, China gets positioned as an other group. And that other group, that national identity, um, is connected with isolationism, uh, non-liberal values, authoritarianism, and a sense of uh, brainwashing. So in these educational debates, uh, people discuss the value of critical thinking, of political dissent increasingly. And there's a sense that uh, people in mainland China are very patriotic and maybe brainwashed, don't have critical thinking skills. Uh, I would argue, I mean, there's research that shows that's not true and that's a very um, simplistic way of viewing things, but the international media certainly supports that view. A lot of research su suggests this. The challenge here is that there isn't um, human rights uh, to political expression in uh, the mainland Chinese system. So we don't really necessarily know uh, you know, exactly what people think, but but certainly people are sort of critical patriots in some context there as well. There's also research that shows a lot of Hong Kong people are not very critical about neoliberal globalization um, and sort of the benefits of a global view. Uh, and the other side of that would be being brainwashed by a Western perspective. Uh, so I've been in my research tracing these trends in the education system. Uh, so the education system does want to support intercultural and multicultural views, an orientation towards human rights um, and cosmopolitanism. Uh, on the other hand, there's this tension increasing with a sense of national identity. So when we look at uh, how cosmopolitanism is represented in the education system, in the curriculum, and in textbooks, uh, there's no doubt that cosmopolitanism is present there. So in a lot of societies, it might be controversial or not discussed directly, more as global citizenship. Actually, in Hong Kong education, cosmopolitanism is embraced. Um, but you see here this connection of cosmopolitan with a Western and universal view, and this pitting against some other views with some interesting um, complications and implications there. So textbooks and curriculum emphasize that people live in a global village, um, that there's interconnectivity, and that it's important to appreciate people from around the world, and taking pride in Hong Kong being diverse, being tolerant, um, and being open to different groups. Um, on the other hand, when there's discussions of China, uh, you see very different description of China and Chinese culture. Um, so it's discussed that it's important to appreciate Chinese culture, uh, but, but it's shown as an ancient traditional culture um, with only sort of ancient and traditional things to offer students, uh, reflecting this sort of tension around national political identity in Hong Kong. A cultural view of political identity is foregrounded um, because the political part is still very, controversial and challenging for a lot of teachers to directly dive into due to the different legal statuses and histories of the two societies. Uh, so Hong Kong is identified as cosmopolitan and uh, Hong Kong people as citizens of the world. Textbooks use the term citizens of the world to describe Hong Kong people, but they overlook, I think, a lot of the challenging issues that students do have to face. So these challenging issues are mentioned uh, but they're mentioned in very different place in the curriculum and in textbooks. And I don't think it really gives students a chance to think through the challenges they actually do face uh, when it comes to sorting out their identity and the complexity of that. Uh, so when they discuss the diversity of Hong Kong, there is a promotion of assimilation of ethnic minorities. Uh, so the sense is that they're, it's great that they're a part of society but they do need to learn Chinese, they do need to assimilate. And here we see 
the history of uh, a British hierarchy uh, in society because there's discussions of ethnic minorities from South Asia, from Africa, they have to assimilate, they have to accept discrimination in some cases as normal um, and, and Western and white expats, um, they're described as expats rather than ethnic minorities. They're not included in that group, showing this kind of historical colonial sense of identity hierarchy. Uh, on the other hand, uh, China is represented as backward and there's a sense of cosmopolitanism too in Hong Kong as we help other countries. So we help mainland China, we help uh, poor people in Africa and other parts of Asia. And this I think is not really a very positive view of cosmopolitanism um, because it makes it seem as if Hong Kong people are sort of above them all. There's a cr critique of uh, Western cosmopolitanism as being very universalistic. And the textbooks do deliberately say, Hong Kong is you know, just the, the greatest place and, and everyone's wealthy and healthy here. And it's part of our duty then to go around to different parts of the world and help people in the different parts of the world. Not mentioning that Hong Kong also has its challenges too. Um, the, the wider political context of treatment of ethnic minorities, of issues with China, does not go addressed in this in this discussion. Cosmopolitanism just becomes something um, very beautiful that we can celebrate, um, and then there's sort of darker implications underneath. So I see that I've uh, taken up my time, uh, but thanks again for listening, and I look forward to uh, the next presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Liz. Um, we are starting to get into really interesting ideas here, including. Um, othering processes, I think. Um, it's given us a lot more to think about now. Our third speaker um, is Professor Jason Gula, Professor of Bilingual Bicultural Education and Director of the Institute for Daisaku Ikida Studies in Education at DePaul University in Chicago and Executive Advisor at the Ikeda Center for Peace, Learning and Dialogue in Cambridge, Massachusetts. At DePaul, he also directs degree programs in bilingual Pi cultural education, world language education, and value creating education for global citizenship. His award winning scholarship in Ikeda Soka Studies, Social Ecological Justice, and Language, Culture, and Education has appeared in multiple volumes and scholarly journals. Jason will be sharing with us on the topic of the Soka movement of cosmopolitanism, Makiguchi, Tode, Toda, and Ikeda. Jason, over to you. So uh, thank you so much uh, to Suzanne and uh, all the organizers of this uh, webinar. It's really a joy to join you from Chicago where it's uh, closing in on 11 o'clock at night. It's a great way to end the day. Um, and I wanna thank uh, Fazal and Suzanne for uh, editing the special issue. I'm going to speak about the Soka movement of cosmopolitanism, uh, specifically Makiguchi Toda and uh, Daisaku Ikeda. Uh, these three are best characterized by their shared commitment to, uh, let me see here. These uh, three are, are best characterized by their shared commitment to the cosmopolitan ethic and to value creation as the font of agency growth and a genuine, almost existential kind of happiness. They also share a deep commitment to respecting the dignity of all human life in accord with the principles of Buddhist humanism, specifically the Lotus Sutra centric teachings of the 13th century reformer Nichiren. These three uh, are the progenitors of Soka or value creating approaches to education and Buddhism. The quote, philosophers of the Soka movement, unquote, that uh, Fazal and Suzanne uh, stated in their call uh, for the uh, for articles for the special issue. I had never heard that term before, but I immediately loved it and thought, yes, I'm gonna use that. So I'm gonna speak about uh, these philosophers of the Soka movement. And I think it's important for us to think about what Dennis shared at the beginning about the rise in populist nationalisms uh, around the world. Certainly we're seeing this in the United States, but many people are seeing it in their countries too. And I think these perspectives and practices echo those of Japan's military fascist government and its oppressive political, social, 
religious and education policies present when Makiguchi and Toda began the Soka movement in 1930. So I wanna talk just briefly about this term Soka and what it means uh, and why we're using it. Um, and I apologize if you can hear noise in the back, that's the heat in my place. So um, Soka, you can see I have the uh, Sino-Japanese characters, uh, is a unique term. It's a neologism that uh, Makiguchi and Toda coined, actually Toda coined it and Makiguchi adopted it for the operating principle of Makiguchi's four volume book, The System of Value Creating Pedagogy, published from 1930 to 1934. And it's taken from the two terms creation, sozo, and value, kachi. So the so of sozo and the ka of kachi gives us soka. And we can think about how this has entered English in two ways. In one sense, it has remained this uh, foreign term and you can see at the top, uh, I have it in lowercase, in italics with the macron over the O for pronunciation. In this sense, it's the generic philosophy of value creation, of creating meaning uh, out of facticity in our life, meaning that has beauty, uh, aesthetic beauty through the senses and gain, individual gain and social good. And you can see Makiguchi is challenging the neo-Kantian perspective of truth is uh, value in and of itself. Makiguchi said that value is born from the subjective meaning we make of truth, not because of truth itself. But then in a second way, this term has entered English as a loan word. Uh, that's the bottom one, a capital S soka. And this I would say is the soka movement. In this sense, it's become kind of a culture or identity ethic. It's identified with the Soka Gakkai, the Soka Gakkai International, which are both developed from an organization that Makiguchi and Toda created uh, at the same time that they published the first volume of the System of Value Creating Pedagogy. It was an organization for teachers who increasingly took on a, a Buddhist practice, not to proselytize in schools, but as a way to transform their own life. Uh, and then uh, Daisaku Ikeda, who I will talk about, uh, used the same term in the name of the Soka schools and universities that he established since 1968 across seven countries in Asia uh, and the Americas. And then it is also used to convey a kind of shared philosophy of Makiguchi, Toda, and Ikeda, including things before Toda and Makiguchi coined this term and including things that they don't call specifically Soka. So let's get into Makiguchi and his perspective of uh, cosmopolitanism. I think it's important to note that none of them actually use this term cosmopolitanism, which would be a kind of uh, foreign sort of term. And so we see them uh, using the Sino-Japanese characters and each comes up with a unique phrase. Makiguchi introduces the concept in 1903 in his book, The Geography of Human Life, and he calls for sekai mi, literally world people. And he uses this concept uh, in relation to a three-tiered kind of identity, saying we should foster a sense of local identity or kyodo mi, a sense of national identity, uh, koku mi, or this sense of, and the sense of a global identity. I think what's important is that Makiguchi is the third person in Japanese history to use this term. The other two are Uchimura Kanzo and Kotoku Shusui, both of whom traveled outside Japan. But Makiguchi never left the borders of Japan and still he was advocating in 1903 for this kind of concept, well before it was addressed by many others. The other term he introduces that conveys this kind of global perspective is Jindo Tekikyoso, which could be translated as humanitarian competition. And he articulates it this way. I'm going to read, so I apologize if I look down. Uh, he says that this is, um, he says that global interdependence is key and that economic competition, political competition, and militaristic competition have exhausted their usefulness. Instead, we need to base uh, these kinds of competition and all competition on humanitarian principles of mutual benefit 
to engender harmonious living for all people and nation states across local and global levels. Quote, what is important is to set aside egotistical motives, striving to protect and improve not only one's own life, but also the lives of others. One should do things for others because by benefiting others, we benefit ourselves. This means to engage consciously in collective life. I think it's important to note that Machiavelli, of course, was influenced by Kant. Uh, the Neo-Kantians were incredibly uh, influential at this time in Japan and certainly after. But if we look at Kant's notes in his uh, work on physical geography, he actually says that he was influenced by the Lotus Sutra of the Japanese. So we can almost see it coming to kind of full circle. And then we move to Jose Toda. In 1952, Jose Toda coins again this unique term, never existed before. Chikyu means okushugi. You can see it's different from Makiguchi's term, but the ethic is there. Toda was speaking specifically to young people, to youth, and he encouraged them uh, of the importance to transcend national boundaries beginning in their heart. And he focuses on this kind of global race or a global people against the backdrop of the Korean War. And we see him really advocating for a kind of pan-Asian solidarity and explicitly rejecting the validity of Cold War divisions. Daisaku Ikeda was there. He was among the youth at the time who heard Toda use this term for the first time. And Ikeda says, the greatest significance should be attached to Mr. Toda's unique concept of chikyu means okushugi. It originated as a rejection of conventional views of the state that subordinate humanity to that state. And he advocates for it to transcend all kinds of discrimination. I think what's really important here, so Toda says that in 52, in 1960, Daisaku Ikeda makes his first of 27 trips to the United States. He comes to Chicago, where I am, and he's walking through Lincoln Park, named after Abraham Lincoln, and he sees an act of racism against a young African-American boy. For those who may not be familiar, this is a few years before the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act. And he says to combat this kind of racial injustice and discrimination, we have to cultivate this ethic of chikyu means okushugi. And then uh, Ikeda uh, in 1992, uh, excuse me, in 1996. So from 1960 until today, Ikeda has been grappling with this concept of cosmopolitanism or global citizenship. It's usually translated as global citizenship for him constantly. But I'm gonna speak about three sort of key points in his uh, thinking about this term. He gives us a, a talk at Teachers College, Columbia University in 1996. Uh, before that, he gives a talk in 93 and 91 at Harvard University. I say that because in 1992, Samuel Huntington uh, gave a lecture on the clash of civilizations, which would then in 93 become this uh, article in foreign affairs. And then in 96 becomes a book. And this book and article and speech uh, are casting a new kind of division, post-World War II division that will happen because of cultural and religious differences. And so we can see Ikeda really challenging this kind of division. Ikeda is always about obliterating divisions in a sense and really bringing people together in the same way that Fazal talked about in terms of interdependence. So in his lecture, Ikeda uses a different term. Chikyu is here, global, but shimin kyoiku, or global citizenship education. And he says the characteristics of global citizenship have nothing to do with the number of countries we go to or the number of languages we speak, but they are characterized or it is characterized in these essential characteristics. The wisdom to perceive the interconnectedness of all life and living, the courage not to fear or deny difference, but to respect and strive to understand people of different cultures and to grow from encounters with them. And the compassion to maintain an imaginative empathy, 
that reaches beyond one's immediate surroundings and extends to those suffering in distant places. What's really important to remember here is that in Ikeda's framework, wisdom, courage, and compassion are also the characteristics of the Buddha and the Bodhisattva. They exist already within us, Ikeda would say. It's a matter of bringing them out, bringing them into a, a fuller kind of flourishing. And that's really important. The other thing that I think is important in this kind of configuration is Ikeda's inclusion of courage. We see wisdom and we see compassion talked about in multiple forms of global citizenship. But Ikeda goes at length about why courage is so important. And actually fear of the other can prevent this kind of global ethic from emerging. Shortly after that, uh, this lecture is considered the founding lecture of Soka University of America, which was uh, established uh, and opened its doors in 2001. And you can read uh, there on the screen one of how he's imagining this university uh, to a, a message he gave in 2004. But he gave the university this mission. This is the university's founding mission to foster a steady stream of global citizens committed to living a contributive life. Indeed, global citizenship is an underpinning ethos and in many of the schools, a curriculum at all of the Soka institutions that he founded. And I think his way of challenging Huntington's perspective became really clear in 2001, shortly after the university opened its doors, September 11th, the 9-11 attacks on the World Trade Center happened, rooted in this kind of religious division. And Ikeda Undaunted, again, promotes the founding ideal of the university. And then 2014, uh, every year since the 80s, Ikeda has been issuing an annual peace proposal. He circulates these to academics and the United Nations and others. And for years, he's been writing about climate justice uh, the Millennium Development Goals and the Sustainable Development Goals. But here in 2014, we see him squarely couching the ethic of cosmopolitanism in the Sustainable Development Goals. Again, he changes the term, not to global citizenship education, but sekai shimin kyoiku, world citizenship education. And he defines it this way. Education to foster global citizenship or world citizenship should deepen our understanding of the challenges facing humankind, enable people to explore their causes and instill the shared hope and confidence that such problems being of human origin are amenable to human solutions. And we should identify the early signs of impending global problems and local phenomena, develop sensitivity to such signs and empower people to take concerted action. And we should foster empathetic imagination and a keen awareness that actions that profit one's own country might have a negative impact on or be perceived as a threat by other countries. And then he encourages us to elevate this to a shared pledge not to seek one's happiness and prosperity at the expense of others. I think a couple of things are important here. This idea of happiness brings this all the way back to Makiguchi's perspective that someone who can create value or meaning from the realities of their circumstances can foster this kind of genuine, authentic, almost existential happiness. The other is of the terms that cohere from the 96 speech to 2014 is this idea of empathetic imagination or an imaginative empathy. And this comes again from Ikeda's Buddhist thinking in Japanese, he uses the term doku, which literally means suffering. And he says, compassion is to remove suffering and to impart joy. So we see in Ikeda this move from global citizenship to combat racism and racial injustice in 60, then to think about uh, this kind of ontological or epistemological kind of understanding, and I'll end with this. At the time that Soka University was being founded, someone asked him at the teacher's college speech if global citizenship wasn't a Western imposition on a kind of Japanese thinking. And he said, I actually am founding the university in the United States, a land committed to human rights so that people from all over the world can come, gather, study, and deeply develop a commitment to human rights. 
In this sense, he saw the university as opening a new era. And he said, in this way, Soka University of America could almost be called World Human Rights University. So he sees it as human rights. And then most recently as an ethic, an educational way of dealing with global climate change. So thank you, I'll end there. Thank you, Jason, um, for the wonderful presentation. Uh, I'd like to introduce you to our last speaker, um, Suzanne, who will also be the moderator of our panel discussion later on. Suzanne Chu is Associate Professor in the English Language and Literature Academic Group at the National Institute of Education. Her research has been published in various uh, journals such as Harvard Educational Review, Research in the Teaching of English, Discourse Studies in the Cultural Politics of Education, among others. Her book, Reading the World, the Globe and the Cosmos, was awarded the 2014 Critics' Choice Book Award by the American Educational Studies Association. Her most recent books are co-edited volumes titled Educating for the 21st Century and Literature Education in the Asia Pacific, Policies and Practices and Perspectives in Global Times. Suzanne will be sharing with us the topic on interrogating 21st century education discourses through the lens of sense, capabilities approach, and Confucian cosmopolitanism. Suzanne? Thank you. Um, I just want to thank uh, Fazal, Liz, Jason, uh, also for contributing to the special issue. Um, so this final presentation, I'm going to focus on 21st century discourses, um, which has become uh, popularized you know, in schools and countries all over the world. Um, but I'm going to interrogate it through the lens of Amatea Sen's human capabilities approach and confusion cosmopolitanism. Okay. So as mentioned, um, all over the world, governments and policymakers are advocating the need to develop future ready citizens, which has led to the popularity of 21st century education frameworks. So some examples you can see here, uh, partnership for 21st century skills, many, I think thousands of schools in the US uh, have adopted this framework. And then there's the OECD's uh, definition and selection of competencies. There's the World Economic Forum's uh, 21st century skills. And also governments in different countries, including Singapore, have ad adopted their own uh, 21st education frameworks. Common in all these frameworks is the emphasis on things like critical thinking, creative thinking, communication, you know, collaboration. So for example, um, you know, uh, here is OECD selection of competencies. It says 21st century skills and competencies are those young people will be required to have in order to be effective workers and citizens in the knowledge society of the 21st century. Now there are two concerns, two main concerns with this. Okay, the first is that the frameworks tend to emphasize skills, uh, leading to skills-based schooling, where it's utilitarian in terms of its logic and the value of an individual is determined by his or her contribution uh, to society. So for example, you see in this, uh, the justification by OECD that success for individuals is gainful employment, you know, income, and then for the society is economic productivity. The second concern is that justifications of 21st century education and education reform uh, are often determined by, grounded on economic reasoning, okay, based on human capital theory. Okay, so Economic reasoning is used to justify education reform through the language of competition, standard streaming, upgrading, rescaling. And as Gopinathan says, education reform is primarily a way of retooling the productive capacity of the system. Education is then seen as an investment in men, primarily viewed as an economic activity, marginalizing non-material dimensions, such as the aesthetics and the arts. So the question is that these knowledge and skills, um, like critical thinking, these are means, but what exactly is the philosophical end of education? Oftentimes the frameworks highlight the skills, but don't really talk about the ends, the philosophical ends. And as Sen observes, the problem is not that nation-centric instrumental goals often take precedence in policies, but it's the lack of clarity whether these are culminating goals or are more intermediate goals that should serve a larger purpose 
of contributing to human life. So therefore, what is an alternative? I think uh, SENSE uh, human capabilities approach offers a very uh, useful uh, frame, a model to, uh, approach to think about. Uh, he conceptualizes mainly in the 1980s and has been revived by Martha Nussbaum. It's premised on this argument that a country's success should not be measured in terms of economic growth as indicated by GDP, but in the way it supports human well-being. So here are some differences between HCT, human capital theory, uh, and human capabilities approach. So HCT is driven by this notion of economic utilitarianism. Whereas HCA is grounded on this idea of human well-being or the Aristotelian notion of eudaimonia, of the flourishing of the individual. Human capital theory pays attention to the means, especially in their frameworks where they valorize competencies and skills to thrive, to compete in the global economy. But HGA focuses on the ends of education, the flourishing of the individual. Um, Sen talks about the importance of opportunity, freedom, and agency for the individual to pursue what he or she values in life. Okay, so, so HCT centers on benefits to the nation in, in terms of creating a skilled uh, labor force, but HCA centers on the flourishing of the individual and the capacity to live fully. Um, so in the way, uh, HCT uh, uh, focuses on the individual as a servant of the state, whereas HCA argues that the state and those in power are accountable okay, to helping, enabling the individual to flourish. Okay, one of the key criticisms of HCA that has come up is, is that it advocates a kind of ethical individualism in which the actions uh, are based, are judged on the effects of individuals. There's very little attention given to the person's intersubjective relations and responsibility to others. This focusing on the flourishing of the individual discounts the individual's intersubjective relations to other people. So in a way, um, HCA can be further complemented and extended with Confucian cosmopolitanism. Cosmopolitanism, uh, most scholars uh, will, will trace it back to the Greek idea of citizen of the world. And I think to date, there has been many varieties of cosmopolitanism. But I want to focus on the Confucian notion of cosmopolitanism, and I want to uh, distinguish it from the Western varieties, specifically the Stoic, Enlightenment, and New Cosmopolitan understandings of the term. So one distinction is the idea that the human being is a participant as opposed to just the citizen of the world. Right? For Stoics, uh, the citizen of the cosmos uh, is governed by logic, denoting speech and rational thought. So only the rational individual can com com comprehend divine universal law. But conversely, uh, Confucian cosmopolitanism uh, perceives the universe not as an external entity grasped by reason, where on the other hand, heaven or tian is imminent within the human being who seeks harmony through recovering his or her ontological unity with the way of heaven. So the self seeks to live fully, but it's not a self-seeking endeavor. Rather, it's this continual cultivation of character. So one very important concept in Confucianism is run, okay, which uh, people have translated it as kindness, benevolence, but it's, I think it's closely related to the notion of cosmopolitan love. For Confucius, run starts with the family, but should extend outwards right, to the country, the community, and then the world. So if you see uh, the Chinese character run is made up of two characters, Ren, which is person, and the number two, right? In the Analex, uh, the disciple asks, you know, what, what is Ren? And Confucius says, it is to love others. Others not just in your home, but it should be extended to the world. So this uh, brings us to the second distinction, right? The human being as embodied, as, as opposed to some abstract citizen of the world. So Enlightenment cosmopolitanism advocated uh, by Kant in the 18th century proposed a kind of abstract universalism, right? That we are citizens of this abstract notion of the world. And it's been recently revived by uh, Nussbaum, who advocates being philosophical 
exiles from our own way of life and giving that community of humanity our first allegiance. Okay. On the other hand, Confucian cosmopolitanism offers a more practical alternative. Um, it recognizes that the self is embodied in realities, in concrete realities, and shares affinity to multiple spaces, the home, the family, the country, and the world. Okay, the third distinction is that um, Confucian cosmopolitanism emphasizes this idea of relational learning as opposed to just a moral response or moral orientation. So in, in Western scholarship on cosmopolitanism, um, I think the, the buzzword now is new cosmopolitanism, you know, popularized by uh, Apia, Baba, Ulrich Beck, you know, this idea that we can be rooted to home, open to the world. They share some uh, affinity with Confucian cosmopolitanism. But I think a lot of new cosmopolitanism describes cosmopolitanism as a kind of orientation or what Beck calls an outlook, a, a moral response to otherness. For Confucianism, however, there is a very strong emphasis on learning, continual learning. And another key concept is Li or ritual. How do we learn to embrace otherness? It's not something that you can learn in the classroom. It's something that you practice through rituals that are not supposed to be mechanized okay, uh, routines. Rather, it is aimed at cultivating dispositions like respect, empathy, hospitality. Okay, so. So I want to propose the third approach, uh, which is the cosmopolitan dispositional approach. So unlike uh, HCA, human capability approach. The cosmopolitan dispositional approach is grounded on the flourishing of self and others in the world, right? Its attention is to, it also pays attention to ends, but these ends are not so much opportunities, freedom and agency for the individual, but are cosmopolitan dispositions. I mentioned some like empathy, hospitality, as well as a concern for justice, okay? Um, and it centers on everyday practices, Okay, rather than you know, abstract ideas, what are the everyday practices that can disrupt parochialism? So this notion of cosmopolitan, uh, cosmopolitanism from Confucius is other-oriented. As he says, a humane person who wishes to steady himself or who wishes to succeed helps others steady themselves or helps others succeed. Because he wishes to reach his goal, he helps others to reach theirs as well. So I want to give one example. Um, one very common um, 21st century skill is critical thinking. You see it in all the frameworks. From a human capital theory approach, critical thinking tends to be conceptualized in a very decontextualized way as productive skills, critical reasoning, problem solving. Um, you see things like um, Bloom's taxonomy, Paul's wheel of reasoning, uh, very popularly used in schools. From a human capability approach, we would think about critical capabilities, which are how do schools, uh, policies, programs, and practices provide opportunities, freedom, and agency for students to fully develop the capabilities to critically analyze systems of power and engage in informed reasoning about knowledge and values they perceive as significant for their well-being. The cosmopolitan dispositional approach would focus on the kinds of critical ethical dispositions we can cultivate in schools, that students can analyze these causes that perpetuate injustice, that students can actively engage with marginalized, oppressed communities in their society and the world. And it's not just a skill, it's a disposition, it's an orientation. Okay, uh, a second uh, implication for 21st education, century education would be dispositional routines, as opposed to thinking routines. Right, right now in, in schools uh, in Singapore, I think around the world, that the idea of thinking routines is very popular. Okay, so one, ex one popular example is Harvard's uh, Project Zero thinking routine box, uh, which a lot of teachers use in the classroom. But routines are not just for thinking, right? Routines uh, in Confucianism, it's really about character. Now, there are also a lot of routines that we don't think about in schools, right? Like flag raising, saying the pledge, wearing the uniform, and so on. But a lot of the routines in schools are nation-centric. Uh, 
they reinforce nation-centric views and patriotism rather than cosmopolitan views. So I want to give two examples um, of literature classrooms I've uh, observed and, and I've worked with these teachers um, about routines that, that are different, that might have a cosmopolitan uh, sensitivity underlying them. So for example, in one class, I saw this idea of the listening routine that the teacher continually emphasized. She made students take notes uh, and listen attentively whenever their peers were sharing. And she said that this is because in the past, students only took notes whenever the teacher talked. But she made it a point that she wanted to inculcate the habit of seriously listening to their peers and respecting the opinions of others. Okay, in another class, this was an international school in Singapore, um, and in a language arts class, I saw that the teacher continually devoted 15 minutes of independent reading time in his curriculum every lesson. And his entire class, you can see here in this picture, was filled with books from all around the world. Students can read any book that they want around the world, but the idea was that they read. They read uh, to know the world. Okay, it's, it's to foster this habit of wanting to learn about others in the world. So these are just some examples of how we need to think about uh, the cosmopolitan routines in our classroom. I just want to end uh, with the relevance of Confucian cosmopolitanism to 21st century education. I think primarily its relevance is to call us to center the goals of 21st century or future-oriented education on ethical rather than utilitarian grounds, right? And to reinforce the important role that education plays in disrupting egoism, parochialism, fundamentalism, all forms of intolerance, by focusing on habitual character dispositions and putting that at the center of education. Okay, so let me just end with one quote. Um, one of the disciples asked Confucius, you know, is there a single word that can serve as a guide to conduct throughout one's life? Confucius says, it is the word shu. Do not impose on others what you yourself do not want others to impose of you. So we might recognize this as the golden rule, right? Um, but this word shu is very interesting. In the Chinese character, it's made up of three characters. The top part has the word nui or woman and then ho mao, which is the idea of a woman listening to the words of another. But underlying it is the word sing or heart. So in translation, it means listening to the heart of another, right? Which is akin to a kind of empathy. Um, and so I think, you know, if we think about education for the 21st century, one of its primary goals would be how can we foster this notion of listening to the heart of another person, right? And taking seriously the, the words of another, not imposing our value systems, not imposing our beliefs, all right? Um, but understanding where the other comes from, the other's history, the other's um, social political background, um, and really engaging with otherness at the forefront of our education. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. Uh, for your presentation. Uh, We're now going to go directly into the panel discussion. Um, and I think we have one question from uh, one of our participants. I'm just going to read that out uh, and, and let Suzanne open the panel uh, up for discussion. Um, so this is from Nilima. Um, and the question goes, the pleasant impossibility of cross-cultural uh, cross learning, especially in today's well-connected world, is critical to global citizenship. However, my concern I want to share is that with easier access to different cultures, groups, and information, which unfortunately are also influenced by biases and commercially driven social media, people can also hurt and build bigger divides. Divides based on even the meanings of terms, me and you, West and East, poor and rich, developed and underdeveloped. Um, how can we as educators contribute into reducing this sad reality and help students become compassionate, empathetic, and discerning global citizens? I think we're going to make this panel discussion conversational. So I'm going to ask Fazal, Jason, Liz to turn on your, uh, unmute yourself and let's, let's try, uh, any one of us can just respond to the question. Um, I, can, I can say something briefly. Uh, because I think this connects a little bit to one of my challenges at looking at the curriculum um, in, in different countries when it relates to civic education and moral and political education. I think there's a tendency, uh, and this is a challenge for multiculturalism in particular, to 
to want to introduce new cultures and new topics and positive recognition into uh, schools and lessons, but in a way that makes it very simplistic. Um, and that can lead to some very um, strange sort of, uh, I would say, mistakes in curriculum. Like in Hong Kong, some, a textbook will say something like, in the north of the world, people are um, richer and healthier than in the south part of the world. And I think what happened here is there's some kind of um, north and south uh, discussion and globalization theory, but they crystallize it and they simplify it so much that it actually is not helpful at all. It's completely absurd. Um, I think this happens quite frequently where there's very stereotypical view introduced. Um, so I would distinguish this from an intercultural approach, which is more about understanding there's actually diversity around you. There's actually diversity in other schools, people in your class, you might not recognize that they um, you know, are different from you. And part of that inter is to also engage in some discussion and to develop like those skills and dispositions as Suzanne said. So those are some of my initial thoughts. And I say that uh, connectivity can always produce uh, contrary and contradictory outcomes. Uh, just because uh, your cultures are rub rubbing up against each other. I was thinking about Jason's uh, reference to uh, how the Soka um, philosophers and uh, activists have uh, responded to Samuel Huntington. Uh, now, after 9-11, uh, when I was living in the United States in Illinois, as it happens, Jason, <laughs> um, I found it very interesting how uh, the debate turned around Huntington, and uh, some people suggested that 9-11 uh, that was, uh, if you like, reaffirmation of uh, the cl of clash of civilization. And other people like Soka, you know, said that it, it showed completely different. So in other words, uh, uh, what didn't happen was the meeting connectivity itself was not problematized. Uh, so basically the outcomes of pro uh, connectivity was explored and interrogated, but not the nature and the politics of connectivity. And that's actually what I'm working on right now, is how do we actually understand um, uh, uh, connectivity? So there is a huge amount of connectivity in Hong Kong, in Singapore, in, in Chicago, in Australia, you know, but. Uh, but how do we understand that connectivity? You know, that is not uh, as uh, much focused upon as perhaps it should be, you know, so that, uh, so that we do not actually make uh, generalizations about North and South. I mean, it's difficult to not use those terms because uh, categories are important with which we think, you know, always important. Uh, I and thou yeah. is a ca our categories, you know. Um, but you know, it's uh, it's it's a question of how do you problematize those categories? How do you problematize the North and how do you problematize the West? So I'm not really interested in abandoning the notion of or West, but uh, actually attempts to understand how the processes of colonial meeting West got defined in a particular way and is now defined in a slightly different way. So. Meeting is what my focus is on, and I think the 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 the, the, the yeah, Hunt, Huntington example is really quite an interesting one. I mean, I've been thinking quite a bit about how hunting what Huntington was received after nine eleven. You know, over the next ten years, uh, now it's not uh, considered all that important. But there were a large number of Orientalist scholars, like uh, like Bernard Lewis, for example, who absolutely embraced. Huntington, you know, as a reaffirmation. So um, I think I think that suggests that meeting produces contradictory um, cont contradictory outcomes, and we've got to understand the nature of meeting itself. Yeah, yeah, and I I think this reminds me why I think in education we we need to focus on the pedagogies, you know, uh, of of meeting. You know, how 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 do we um, train students to or equip them to handle difference, you know, in, in the classroom, um, especially when it's at, when it comes to controversial issues or conflicts between value systems. One example I can think of recently is the, um, the whole free speech incident, um, the beheading of the history teacher in France. And how there are two di different groups, right? One group is, is advocating free speech, the freedom to say whatever you want, to print cartoons that may be insulting to another religion. Um, and then another group that, that 
feel slighted, feels not heard. Um, you know, and, and it all erupted into violence, the, the beheading of a man. You know, so I think in, in, in education, the question is that a lot of cosmopolitan discourse talks about the idea of affinity, um, meeting, you know, and all that. But, but how, how, how in our classrooms, how in education can we really empower our students to deal with differences? And especially when it comes to religion, which is very controversial. Um, I don't know whether Jason has any, I think your idea of the empathetic imagination is very powerful here. That's, that's not my idea. That's uh, yeah, yeah, that, that you're... <laughs> but um, I, I would say a couple of things. I, I think it resonates with what you're all saying. So I would agree. I think for Ikeda especially, it's fundamentally rooted in this, in an essentialized way we can say, but I think it is in some ways real, this Eastern understanding of the self and other as one. They are two, but not two fundamentally. And so we have to operate with this understanding of a profoundly internalized other, and that it is only by engaging the other that the self can fully develop. For him, that's a fundamental sort of starting point. And the master key to begin to do that for him, I didn't talk about it, is dialogue. I mean, he's published um, more than 80 dialogues with thinkers across all kinds of fields. And so I think for him, that has... Uh, manifest in recommendations that the schools, the Soka schools, we can look maybe at Soka University, but there's a Soka kindergarten in Singapore and a Soka kindergarten in Hong Kong. They're teaching languages, multiple languages to little kids. Uh, but at Soka University of America, everybody studies a foreign language. It, it has a massive international population and everyone must study a language that is not their own. And then everyone must study abroad. So they come into the United States and then they must go somewhere else. And then they do that in the same year of their schooling. And what it does is it forces them to be the other. And then they come back and they can talk about this shared experience of being the other and how it shapes their understanding. So I think we can see that that doesn't make a, a, a global citizen, but it's a starting point curricularly. And then I would say the last thing is, Makiguchi's second work, 1912, is uh, looking at the local community as the integrating sort of focus of education, that all foundational concepts can be gleaned from just looking at the local community. And he started, it's a very Herbardian or Pestalozzian kind of way, start with the known and the familiar and move out to the distant and imagined. And by doing this, we can look at the way we use and engage with all the things around us. And we can imagine and kind of understand how the other may do the same things, whether it's natural phenomena or you know, other sorts of things. So curricularly, they were also thinking about this. Interesting that, but uh, you know, mobility, um, going abroad and engaging with other cultures uh, is really quite important, but it also uh, ha uh, has certain risks that we've got to remember. Um, I sent uh, a few years ago a group of students to Turkey uh, from, from University of Illinois. And uh, uh, I was talking to two or three girls who went to Turkey and came back with uh, attitudes towards the Turk other, even more racist than they had before. In other words, uh, their travel produced uh, uh, and re reaffirmed uh, their, 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 their various... Uh, popular misconceptions about uh, Turks being misogynist, Turks being, being, uh, being, being uh, violent and uh, hostile. Uh, so in other words, all the ideas about Islam that they had learned you know, in the United States were reinforced as a result of uh, uh, them going to, I mean, what it suggests to me is exactly what uh, Suzanne is saying, that pedagogy was really poor. You know, that we didn't do enough work in trying to actually get them understand and inter interrogate the cultural contact that they were going to have. Uh, in other words, the, the notion, the cultural contact itself was not problematized. As a result, was interpreted within the existing uh, stereotypes and existing prejudices. Uh, so I think we've got to actually understand how even sending people and engaging with other cultures can have completely the opposite effects to the ones that you might uh, intend for, for them to have. 
I'm sure you've come across these kind of examples as well. <laughs> how, how does Soka deal with that? You know, that, uh, that uh, engagement with the other can reproduce, which is the question I think the person was asking, you know, um, yeah, I mean, can reproduce I think, the very problems that right, we started off the, with. At the, at the university level, I mean, at the kindergarten level, they're really engaging kind of right. different cultures and having them just like Suzanne's uh, example of reading literature from other cultures and studying languages from a very early age. But at the university level, I think the kind of culture of the university itself that everyone will be leaving, everyone must go out and be the other. It's sort of built into the DNA of the institution from the moment students come in. I think they know they're going to be doing it. I think that helps develop what is the sort of pedagogy that we're talking about. I direct world language programs and bilingual programs. I myself studied abroad in multiple countries. I'll tell you, I'm, I feel really bad that these girls would come back and say that. For me, having lived in Russia, having lived in Japan, these will never just be places on a map. Mm -hmm. These are places where I lived. These are people, you know, it's home to people I engaged with who welcomed me into their homes and cared for me and when I was sick and fed me. and there's no way to view it as the other. It's sort of become part of me. And I think that's one of the gems of studying abroad. And then that kind of template is a way of imagining the other, even in places you don't go, where the different ways of doing things are different. They're not bad. They're just different. You know? but can I ask you then, Jason, how is it that you came back with engagement with the other in that way and these girls came back you know, we've got to try to understand that. How is it that uh, your circumstances produced, uh, you know, one kind of outcome and their, their, their engagement produced a completely different kind of outcome? Yeah. Well, I have a, a idea related to that. So I've been listening to this discussion. Um, and the first thing I thought of when, Jason, you mentioned your example is in Hong Kong, I'm not sure if it's all the universities now, but uh, it might be all of them. But I know some universities I'm familiar with they require um, service learning abroad for every single student mm -hmm. as part of the requirement. And that's the requirement for internationalization. And I think it's a response to recognizing that the curriculum in the schools is too knowledge-based. So they discuss Chinese culture and cosmopolitanism, but they know that they're not talking about dispositions. So they get every student to go to uh, different countries. And what they learn tends to be what They've known all along these stereotypes uh, because they are service learning projects, these stereotypes that Hong Kong is developed and everything's great in Hong Kong. And they're just helping everyone in the world and being uh, saviors to other people around mm -hmm. the world. And for some students, I've, I've looked at some student experiences with this. Some students do have like transformative experiences and think more deeply, uh, but I don't think it has anything to do with what schools are doing. It must have to do with um, you know, dispositions and traits they've learned outside of, outside of schools, uh, because it's totally random which students have a meaningful experience and which ones just have their uh, prejudice just affirmed um, again and again. Yeah, I've talked to a few students also, and I, I think, I think uh, that one danger of service learning is the reinforcement of cultural superiority. You know, that I, I think, um, you know, it, it is, it, can happen when students come back and, and, and reinstate how, how great their country is. Um, so it reinforces the ego, I think. But I want to go back to uh, Jason's point um, he made earlier about this idea of the imagination. I think it's very powerful. Uh, it reminds me of, um, you know, uh, Gayatri Spivak, the post-colonial scholar, her, her comment that uh, aesthetic education um, should test the limits of the imagination to know the other, which is, that we need to pay more attention to things like the arts, you know, and, and how they can continually problematize uh, our understanding of the other. The minute we think we know the other, we don't. We have to interrupt this with an alternative narrative. Um, so I think that, I think all the more in today's climate, right, aesthetic education plays that fundamental role in, in really always expanding the imagination and expanding the imagination's capacity to to know, um, to understand the other, including the history, the politics, and so on, uh, of otherness. The, the other thing I would add, maybe, Fazal, to, to your question is, um, I think at the Soka institutions, they're, 
It's founded upon this uh, pedagogical principle of value creation, which is essentially to create mm -hmm. meaning, meaning from mm -hmm. the realities, the facticities of one's circumstances. So aesthetically, what is the beauty you can create from it? What is the personal gain or subjective gain you can create from that? Mm -hmm. uh, and then what is the social good? Uh, so from the self to the whole. I think no matter what kind of negative experience you have, how mm -hmm. can you transform that into something that yeah is a value, um, not moral values, it's not that, it's not, and it's not value prescription or value consumption. And I think in this sense, Ikeda especially, even though it's Makiguchi's pedagogy, we see Ikeda really challenging people to bring out this kind of creativity. It's not you know, value consumption, so you, you constantly have to be engaged in the realities. And I think in that sense, even if you're, you know, thrown off by something you see if you are cultivated to create value as a, as a way of being, as an ontological sort of thing that's fostered pedagogically, then I think you're always willing, you're nimble, no yes. matter what the, no matter what the, the environment brings. Great. I think, um, I think it's spot on actually, because uh, that actually um, it highlights the importance of criticality, yeah. you know, so you're not only actually engaging with the other, you are engaging with the other thoughtfully, reflectively, critically, if you like, uh, and also trying to imagine uh, empathetically and sort of imagining how things might be otherwise, not only for them, but for yourself, you know? So those are the kind of things that actually says that, uh, you know, empath empathy is important, imagination is important, but if criticality is not also there, in the mix, uh, then uh, you, uh, you you risk the kind of dangers that uh, of reprodu reproducing stereotypes, et cetera, that you have, you know, uh, yeah. because it's possible to imagine, um, ima imagine the other in Orientalist terms, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. um, Orientalist scholars at SOAS and places like that spend years and years deep engagement with India and China and Africa, came, coming back with, uh, with deeply, deeply, Har har harmful stereotypes uh, and generalizations uh, that uh, have uh, um, resulted in many students uh, learning from those and sort of saying, oh, that's how they, they must be, you know? Yeah. Okay, I think that we have uh, maybe just a few, one, one question left, uh, five more minutes uh, to answer one question. I'm just gonna try to synthesize all the other questions. I think many of them are asking about the tensions and how, you know, in cosmopolitanism, this idea of the citizen of the world, global citizenship, how do we grapple with the tensions, like, for example, um, between freedom and agency on the one hand, and say, communitarian values on the other hand, how do we grapple with the tensions of, say, values of the nation that might conflict with, you know, global values, if, if there's such a thing? Yeah, what are your responses to these, the, these tensions of cosmopolitanism? Go for it, Liz, you are the philosopher. Well, I think, um, Sudha, I think your presentation really highlighted some um, interesting features of this when it comes to a, an Asian or Chinese Confucian influence cosmopolitanism. Um, yeah, I think there are ways that, that the meetings can be um, very tense. And I think there's probably not a single way, like I've looked at this in America compared to Hong Kong. So in America, there is a tension that is pretty obvious between like global values and American values, like who a person should support. America should come first, right? Um, and historically in Hong Kong, it's been totally different. It's like global, um, global society should come first, but that doesn't make it a good thing because global society in this case could mean um, free market economy should come first, neoliberalism should come first. Hong Kong being a sort of Higher, higher than other countries in the world makes it to, to come first. Um, so here you also find like local and the international values echoing each other and supporting each other, but those values might not necessarily be values we actually want to promote. They're totally different than the values um, that Jason was talking about with his, with the, those visions of a uh, deep view of cosmopolitanism. They're not actually moral visions. It's more sort of like political friendships. So those are just some initial thoughts I have. And it's not about hiding the differences, but maybe even in the classroom, um, making that explicit, the differences between these values and 
and going back to this idea of value creation, let students dialogue, you know, and 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 discuss, you know, construct their own understanding uh, of these. Yeah. Okay. I think our time is up, so I'm going to hand it over to Dennis to round up and say a few words. Does anyone else want to make a final comment? The only point that I want to make is I think it's actually mistaken to assume that there are such things as national values. Okay. I mean, I actually always find within each nation that I have been to, lived in, you know, there is such great diversity that uh, to actually use the term national values is quite, quite, quite damaging. So in the United States, you can get the rednecks and you can get people like Jason, you know, deeply civilized and decent people, you know, and, uh, and, 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 you know, I mean, America is a land of contrast. To actually assume that in America, people are like that is actually mistaken. And I think uh, that actually leads to self images that are not very positive, not very helpful. With that um, final note from Fazal, I think the problem with something like this is that we're just starting to get into the meat of the conversation. We're having a good dialogue here. But unfortunately, um, we do have to end this. Um, I think Jason needs to go to sleep <laughs> somewhere in America. And um, we, we, should, we should give him that chance. Um, that's going to be the end of our session today. Uh, and, and thank you for sticking with us till the end. Um, but do bear with us a bit longer. There is a slide coming up, uh, which has a QR code. Um, that leads to a feedback form. Um, your feedback is quite important to us uh, and it will help us in the organization of the, the webinar series. Uh, we'll really like to know especially what kinds of topics you would like us to engage with. Um, this, this, is, this is a starting point for many of us and um, in, especially do have a look at the, the Asia Pacific Journal of Education special issue. Um, there, there, there are quite a number of articles in there which really engage with some of the uh, discussion points here. And I think that's quite important for, for, for people to really look into. So that's, that's the slide uh, with the feedback form. If you can have a, um, a quick scan of it and if you can contribute one or two minutes of your time into that. Um, I, and, and I want to end with, with this. People who know me know that my Chinese is horrible. Um, so I might potentially mangle what I'm about to say, but this is a quote from Confucius. Uh, um, translated in English, it's a person who loves is better than a person who knows. And a person who finds joy is better than a person who loves. Now, I hope that you've not only learned something today, but uh, you can begin to find your way uh, towards a deep appreciation and joy of not just understanding those ideas that we have today, but of, of other cultures, of other people, and, and, and really think about some of the effective domains that Fazal has talked about, and, and to see how we can begin to really unpack this idea of Asian cosmopolitanism, and how that can actually then go into how we really think about our education system as well. With that, I really want to thank you very much. And I would like to thank the speakers. Uh, thanks for your time. Uh, it's great to have you here. And um, good morning, good evening, good afternoon for everyone. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.